morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Greg Livingstone with Blue Attack, and uh, I am the, uh, the pitch moderator. So I'm subbing in for the, uh, uh, the normally scheduled moderator here to uh, introduce our first talk here at the conference. And uh, so I have the, the honor of introducing Brian Johnson from Arizona Public Services. Um, Brian's served, uh, he's had uh, 25 years experience in critical maintenance and lubrication engineer for the nation's largest nuclear power plant, Palo Verde, in beautiful Arizona. Uh, his primary responsibility is to evaluate and specify lubricants for plant use and perform predictive maintenance, condition monitoring duties related to loop testing and, uh, and data evaluation. He's also runs the uh, station's lubrication program, loop storage, cleanliness requirements, usage documentation, root cause determination, uh, and he's uh, spent six years as a maintenance engineer at a naval training facility in upstate New York. He's a certified lubrication grease specialist by NLGI. Um, holds a master's in uh, master's degree in mechanical engineering and uh, chairman of the International Council for Machinery Lubrication (ICML). Um, and uh, he's also the current chairman of ASTM DO2 CS96 for. Um, I, basically, the body of ASTM that develops standards and guides for monitoring in-service uh, lubricants. And uh, he's also been awarded the fellow status by ASTM for his contribution. So, um, Brian is a uh, very, uh, he's a, the big man on campus, so I, I have the, uh, the honor to present, uh, to introduce him here. And he has a talk on understanding the new asset management standard for lubricated machinery. Please join me in welcoming Brian. Uh, Greg, thank you very much for that, uh, that wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, I have had the, the, the pleasure to be in the industry for a long time and uh, have uh, seen the industry actually develop, which is kind of a neat thing. Uh, when, I, when I first came into the industry, there was not something like this wonderful conference that we're all able to participate with. Uh, the best I could do was a telephone call to a tech service hotline and to try to gleam any information possible because there just wasn't information available. So I, 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 I commend all of you for taking an active interest in bettering yourself in a knowledge area. And that's really what we're doing here. We're going to talk about uh, asset management and a new standard that IS, ICML is, is put out there. And, and to give you kind of a sense of what this is, uh, you can see the, uh, the booklet off in the corner. But, uh, but basically, uh, asset management is a topic that has been discussed extensively, I believe, in industry for many years under various different forms. Uh, the total quality management might be one form. Reliability center maintenance might be another form. Uh, there are various uh, uh, acronyms that have been developed over the years that kind of go into the same area, but not in the same area for lubrication. And, and I would suggest to everyone in this room that without lubrication, it doesn't work at all. So, so let me try to make a case for why asset management is important. You know, the obvious one is that uh, we do this because we want to make our business more effective and efficient. And we do this because we want to, to show a return, uh, a return in value for our efforts. And I, I believe in terms of a maintenance organization, the reliability piece, the piece that we're all involved with, is perhaps the only piece that is uh, that is a not a cost center. It's 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 a co it's a savings generator. So when we're successful, the plant becomes more successful. I think that's kind of how we think of ourselves. I'm going to suggest maybe another avenue that uh, is another way to look at this. Uh, as as I, I believe everyone is aware, uh, we have some very significant uh, global issues going on right now, and I'll I'll talk to an environmental one, which would be. Uh, the climate change, the climate change that we read so much about, the storms, all the, the damage that's causing. Uh, we've, we've talked about uh, the value of friction reduction in, the, in our industry, and we've, we've talked about that in terms of cost reduction. But I don't know that we've ever really talked about it in, in terms of something that's going to matter to our children and our grandchildren. And, and that would be if we are successful at reducing costs, successful at leveraging the value of our lubrication assets, we, we in this room have the opportunity to lower the pollution levels, lower the CO2 levels globally. You know, you think in terms of a two or 3% uh, 
uh, gain in, in efficiency, and we know we do this in cars. Been a lot of a lot of money spent over the years to have a mile per gallon increase in cars, and the oil we put into our cars is a big piece of that. But we leverage that same thought across all of industry, and and what's what's the value in it? One percent, two percent, three percent? Can you imagine we as an industry, if we focused on that one or two or three percent, it's an easy get, and it's a huge get in terms of all the pollution that's out there. So I would suggest that we also think in terms of our environmental benefit in managing our asset better. And I would also suggest that the lubrication piece is a vital significant piece of asset management. And we're gonna talk about how we do that. I guess uh, before I go on, I, I should, uh, I've had this slide up here in the front. So some key questions, I'm not gonna try to answer them right now. I hope in the course of the next half an hour, we can frame these within the presentation so they have maybe a different meaning than where you'd start with. But just general questions, uh, how is good defined? You know, what does good mean? Do we know? We each have our own paradigm of what we think good is, but what is it? How about best practices? Is, is there anyone here that doesn't feel like they have best practices within their facility? It, it, do, do, we, do we dare raise our hands? Okay, so what does it mean? What is the best practice? How do we define it? How do we describe it? How do we bin it? What do we do with it? And then I'm gonna suggest also, is rather than good and best practices, should our goal really be best possible? Okay, that's also kind of vague. What does best possible mean? Well, hopefully we'll get a little more clarity on that over the next few minutes. Okay, so key terms. We're talking asset management, and, uh, and this is a, a global topic. Uh, so what is asset management? So the first thing we think of is, is the asset is the pump, the valve, the motor, the gearbox, that's our asset. Is that really the only industrial asset that's uh, of importance to have a successful asset management program? Uh, ICML would say no. Okay, so, what, so an asset uh, could be inanimate, it could be a pump, but how about a person? I would offer that everyone in this room is an asset of your organization. You're either a very strong, positive asset, or you're an emerging asset. I don't think we have a bad asset in the group. Uh, financial, tangible. Okay, so now that we have an understanding of what an asset is, the next piece of that is asset management. Uh, the reality of the world is, is that we need a balance. We cannot have a goal of uh, absolute uh, utopia in everything we do because we can't afford it. You know, there, there's a risk and a cost associated with all that, so management talks to that. The balancing of cost, risk, and benefit, and, but how do we do that? And, and so this is a piece of asset management that I don't believe we consider to the point we should. So the final item on this is asset management system. So it's, it's uh, easy to say what the assets are, it's maybe uh, easy to, to say that asset management is risk and benefit and all that sort of thing, but how do you put that into a process so, that, so it has sustainability? That's part of our challenge. Uh, we'll look at this in terms of, uh, of, of how bad it can be. So go ahead and look at these lists and see if any of you see any of these elements in your own work environment. You know, take a look at it. Do you ever see a flavor of the, of the month initiative. Have you ever been uh, someone who's offered that that's, uh, that's the way our business runs? Uh, we're based on tribal knowledge. How many of you have sat in a meeting where you're trying to discuss a problem and you have a fairly careful but controlled discussion and the discussion goes on and you're starting to build towards something until the boss on the end of the table says, yeah, this is what I think we need to do and it stops, okay? What, what does that do for us? So the impact on the organization of all these things is bad. Uh, we, we wind up working at a lower threshold, a lower standard than we would if we had a better process that we could work to versus working to personalities and what's worked well last time, trial and error, those kind of things. We, we want, to, want to move away from that. Uh, this slide uh, kind of uh, frames asset management uh, with, with various important pieces, and there are several of them. 
and I don't have time to try to explore each of them. So I'm going to talk about the safety one. Uh, this, I think, has, has a high value. I believe personal safety is something we can't compromise. And, and I believe organizations that put uh, an anchor into the rock, not just the sand, say, we're not going to hurt people. There, there's a very high value of that. But in, in managing assets carefully, we have a better chance to be successful in that area, not hurting somebody. We don't want to send somebody home different than we, we received them. Parts of that would be if we have a, uh, if we manage our risk carefully, which safety is part of, well, we're going to have less business intrusion into our processes. Things are going to work better. And uh, we have better planning and control because of that. So anyway, there are other elements here. Uh, I believe the slides are available. You want to take a look at them, explore it further. They'd, they'd be available for you to do so. Uh, standards that de define excellence. Uh, is everyone familiar with the ISO 9000? ISO 9001? Have you heard about that? Did you know about that uh, many years ago? You no, know, maybe, maybe not. But, but this term has become synonymous with, with, a, with an element of how we manage our businesses. Uh, I, I, I'm going to offer that ISO 55000 is going to do the same thing to asset management. And this product that ICML has developed is a way of how we do that within the lubrication world. So the 55000 is more encompassing than lubrication, but we're very carefully defining what we do within our own realm. Now that part of our process that we can control. A little bit of background into the ISO 55000. Uh, uh, the, uh, the British had an asset management standard past 55. Uh, it's now been canceled. That was a forerunner to help develop what the ISO 55000 is. So uh, there is precedence, there's, there's a process that has been developed, that has been vetted, that's worked, that's been uh, moved into an international standard, this 55,000. So what does this mean for us today? Well, you, you can see this uh, very clever graphic. And what, what I would suggest is, is that we do have the first part of this done. Part one, ICML 55.1, you can get a copy of it. And what this is, is uh, a list of requirements and elements that make a program successful. And, and it is all encompassing. It's, it's more than just the lubricant because you can't have a successful lubrication program without other pieces. The other two, 55.2 would be how to implement it. The 55.3, when that comes out, is going to be how we, de how we audit ourselves, how we decide how well we're doing against the standards. Are we successful? Where can we find improvements? So that would be a third party's look at our process to help us get better. Uh, the ICML 55, uh, we, we, it was broken down into uh, 12 key areas that are related to lubrication. And some of these, you might look at it and you might say, you know, is this really lubrication? I'm gonna say yes. Uh, troubleshooting, if we troubleshoot equipment that's lubricated, is that related to lubrication? I would suggest yes. We can make a lot of errors in the lubricant we specify. Uh, skills, job tasks, training, and competency. Everyone in attendance in this meeting benefits by uh, knowledge transfer, knowledge gaining, training, opportunities like this, very, very positive. So anyway, these, these 12 items would be uh, wheels on the spoke, so to speak. So I'm going to kind of dive in on one of the 12 to explore it a little bit more deeply to kind of give you a sense of how these things are organized. And each of the 12 would have a similar pattern. So, so in this case, uh, we'll look at lubrication management. And, and this is something that we commonly do. I think this is intuitive to most organizations. It would have uh, a piece of uh, how do we decide what we place into equipment? And how do we decide when we bring it in that it's really what we ordered? Uh, how long do we keep it? How do we store it? We place it in the machinery. How long do we leave it there? And then when it ends its life cycle, what do we do with it? So one element of the ICML 55.1 would be to do all that for lubrication uh, management. So it's a life cycle approach. And really, all of these 12 elements <coughs> would also have a life cycle type element associated with them. Let's go back to our earlier questions. Uh, how is good defined? 
So, so how would you define good for lubrication management programs? Anyone, anyone dare offer a, a thought on that? Yes. If good is supposed to be less than best practice, then, then good in your organization could be that you just get the oil in and you just assume that new oil is clean oil and you throw it into the machine, that's it. That may be good in your, but it's not best practice, but it may be good because that's all we know. And, and so what does best practice mean? Do you have a, an idea on that? I, I'll point this way, so anyone that dares a... <laughs> Yeah, do you have some thoughts on what you think best practice is? Yes. I mean, using, you know, filtered oil, clean oil, going into machines that are properly labeled, you know, what should be going in it. You know, the, the machine is modified with, you know, your site glasses, your freezers, you know, just the, the whole game bit of tools that we know about. Okay, good. Thank you very much. So, so the next question, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll pick on you for this one. Uh, are the concepts of good and best practices as they were described, are they sustainable the way they described them? W would you be able to maintain best practices using the criteria he gave? Yes, just the way um, something that's uh, better, something that's better than us, uh, we can say it as a best practice. Yeah, and, and I think that is mainly true. I, I think our, our challenge with that is, is that those terms are so generic in nature uh, that they move. And they're so generic in nature that different people think they mean different things. So what you consider to be best practice might not be what your boss's boss's boss thinks best practice is, because that gentleman might think best practice is lowest possible cost. So, you know, so, so some of these things I think have, have a risk. It's, you know, these terms have risks. So let me, let me throw out best possible. So best possible also brings in the concept of risk and benefit, not just the goodness of what we do, but how does it balance? So you think in terms of that, and we're talking about elements of this that can help us be successful. You're, yes? You're not reinventing the wheel. These are standards that are working in the industry, right? You're not trying to do that. No, sure, right. Follow best practices for me, I guess, is what's actually happening, happening in the industry. Right. In general, everybody's following. If I follow this to the letter, then I could be headed towards best practices. Right? Yeah, and, and, and I would suggest that because what best practices are has never been compiled for the lubrication industry, it's very hard to know what it is we're working toward. Mm -hmm. Now, we can come to a meeting like this and hear the best talk we've ever heard and we know it's true, we take it back to our plant, and can we convey that to the boss's boss's boss? You know, probably not. Now, how can we anchor that? You know, so there needs to be an extra piece, but I think you're on the right track with it. Okay, so some attributes of these 12 things. I talked about the one, I kind of dove in a little bit. Uh, job, task, skills, training, and competency. Uh, they, they, they mentioned, Wes mentioned the uh, certifications that ICML will be offering. Uh, that would be one obvious way to demonstrate that uh, that there's competency and a training in the process, uh, certifications that can be tracked and whatnot, that would be an important piece. Are our people an asset that, that will produce at a known level? You know, do, does management have that confidence? Uh, do we have some way to demonstrate some, some level of, uh, of capability? Machine lubrication and condition monitoring, uh, we all have probably oil monitoring programs. Uh, but what is that? You know, there, there are pluses and minuses. Is the, test, is the testing good? Is the data quality? What is the variation in data? What does the data mean for a, a small volume versus a big volume? There are lots of opportunities to, uh, to make that better as well. The right test. The right test. The right package. Right, and, and how many of us have uh, purchased a test that may not have a, a strong value for what we're monitoring because that's the standard package the lab, lab offers. I don't know that that's, that's as, as bad as it is now today, no. but 25 years ago, I would suggest that everybody offered exactly the same packages for all machinery. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Yeah. It's quite often I experience that, that, that people have this package, uh, standard package, and then they say, and then I, uh, you know, I, I put on these bad practices, but I cannot see that they actually improve something. Right. And that's because they didn't measure it. Yeah, and, and, and I can share a story with that. You know, I've been working at the plant for many, many years, and, uh, 
And there were people that from time to time have thought we've done a good job. So in my industry, if somebody is noted as doing a good job, other people come to visit. So, so we had a group come in. Uh, uh, it was uh, somebody that represented seven coal power plants in the Midwest. And I wanted to see what we were doing. So I, I'm, I'm chatting with the guy. So I, I asked him, I said, well, your program, what are some of your big successes? <clears throat> and all of us would tend to go to the biggest save we've ever had. That would be the first thing we'd say, <clears throat> which, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> which I would suggest doesn't necessarily mean we have a good program. It means that we got at least one right. But when I asked this gentleman, what, what's your success? And he says, well, you know, really, they're talking about canceling us. Well, what do you do? And he gave me this big, long list of testing they've done on machinery, a, a big population of samples they've done. Well, why would you cancel that? It sounds like you have a good basis for a successful program. So what does he say? He says, well, because we have never identified an adverse condition. Now, can you imagine a fleet of seven coal power plants with an active condition monitoring program that is not able to find at least one nugget in several years, you know, something's wrong. There's, there's, there's a, there are missing elements in, in their, their program, their asset management process that need to be plugged. It should have been plugged. I don't know if they were from the hour or so we spent with us, but uh, it was a start. Okay, some of the other items, uh, lubrication support facilities, uh, every, all of us have a lube room of some sort. And uh, some of us may have had the experience of our lube room starting out with a, uh, a fenced-in area, the side of a building with a drum standing in the area, and rain in the top of the bung of the 55-gallon drums. Has anyone ever seen that anywhere? Uh, hopefully not at your plant for very long, <laughs> but it's, it's a reality. That's, that's a piece of our asset management that is so incredibly important. You, you think about the the millions and millions of dollars of assets that, uh, that that drum of oil is protecting. And we think so little of it that we allow an inch of water to sit on the top of it. Don't even think about it, it's just oil. And, and you've heard that, I'm sure you've heard that within your organizations. Uh, four more, so I'm, I'm, I'm not really spending a lot of time on each because I don't have a lot of time to spend on each. Uh, energy conservation, conservation, environmental impact, I did mention that. Uh, as we become more successful, as we help machines last longer, as we reduce wear rates, as we select the lubricant that is able to stay in service longer and provide good protection, as we select the lubricant that is able to reduce the energy requirement of the machine, each of those elements have a direct impact on the environment. And our industry has a tremendous opportunity to leverage that uh, for, for the good of the world. Isn't that kind of a neat thing to say? that we in our industry have a significant opportunity to make the world better, and we do. Every day we go to work, we do. Okay, so, but, there's always the big but. Uh, there have been many, many good programs that have developed over the years that have had a very strong champion. And you know what I mean by champion. You get that guy that everybody knows on site, and he runs a good program, and he helps the facility and then what happens when the boss's boss uh, gets promoted and a new boss's boss shows up and wants to know what you're doing for me today? You know, the program is successful. We're not failing as much equipment. We run, our, our baseline of how we're operating is, is, has been reduced, but the new guy coming in doesn't know that. So what's his first reaction, his or her first reaction? I'm sorry, ladies. Uh, would be what? To, to scale the program back. Why are we spending money on this? This looks like a big cost drain to our budget. What are you doing for me? So, so that piece, that very success, can be very limiting to us. So I, I would suggest that the 12th element of, uh, of the 12 elements within ICML 55.1, talking to program management metrics, could in many ways be the most important element. And it's one that we don't necessarily think about. We complain about it. You know, so-and-so won't let me come to training anymore because of budget. Has anyone ever thought that in the past? Now, maybe nobody in this room because you were able to convince the boss to let you come. You know, so maybe a little bit different environment with these people, but I think that would be a common thing we'd hear in industry. So, so what this is, and I'm gonna go back to the best uh, possible argument, this, this 12th area. And really what this is, is to have a process in, in, within the management system that is able to uh, 
produce continuous improvement. So less important that every element of the 12 elements in your program is strong, strong and successful, more important that you've evaluated your program and you've gone piece by piece, area by area, and determined what you have, what your program is doing, and then use what you found out, and, and, and uh, again, very self-critically, or by bringing somebody in, uh, decide what the very best level could be for each of those 12 areas. You know, what would the best trained uh, maintenance technician look like? You know, if, if, if you had your way, and I, I'm gonna kind of pick on you a little bit, well, what would what would the premium uh, lubrication technician look like in the industry? Yeah, can you describe him? Uh, other than yourself, of course. Well, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> I I want to see someone who understood lubrication a little bit, understood uh, what was available and uh, where they should best be used. I, I want to see someone who uh, who understood that the same lubricant isn't necessarily going to work for one machine as it does for another. Uh, and I'd want to see someone who knows better than the mix lubricants. So, so, so what I kind of heard is that you would want that person to have several key elements or attributes yeah. in their capability. Uh, and, and you've described several of them. You want knowledge, you want recognition, you want somebody that is intuitive, uh, somebody that can follow a process. You, you, uh, to, to me, I don't want the guy out in the field to be that guy that is willing to guess 20% of the time. Do you want the guesser out there working on your equipment? No, no, so, so that's a piece of it. So, so, so think, any, anyone else want to add to what the ideal maintenance technician would look like? You got some thoughts? Yeah, 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 yeah you in the cool hat. I like wearing hats, so I'm gonna pick on you. <laughs> um, he just needs to be knowledgeable intuitive, follow the program, uh, know what's going on. So you want somebody that knows what they're doing? Yes. And then somebody willing to follow the process, right? Right. You, you don't want, you don't want uh, the, the, the free spirit out there again. No. We, and no we all know that those guys are out there. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and uh, sometimes, they, sometimes they save our bacon, but sometimes they cause an issue that uh, we have to recover from six or nine months later because lubrication is an unusual field in that our decisions have latent consequences. And have you thought about that with what you do? The term latent consequence? I can put an oil into a machine that is the wrong oil that allows those precious surfaces, that engineering surface that we're trying to protect to touch. The other oil that I've always put in there doesn't allow that. This one does. So what happens? Well, I degrade the surface finish. When I degrade the surface finish, I create wear particles. The wear particles accelerate the degradation of the machine and we have a failure six or 12 months later. Now it isn't obvious that the reason we had that failure was because I allowed the wrong oil in. You kind of kind of get what I'm driving at a little bit here? No, very, very important points. So anyway, uh, we need to have a plan in place. We need to have a process, and the ICML 55.1 is a process with requirements in the 12 areas that one could follow to decide how they're doing, and then one could use to establish what good looks like, and then that delta needs to be based upon risk and benefit. And how do we know if we're doing well, what, what good looks like, what best practice looks like? Well, we have self-assessments. We have uh, metrics, we have reports, and we have a management team that is on board enough that they will respond to what our reports tell us to do. Wouldn't that be a great place to be? I could ask something. Yes. Uh, I'm working with the guys that I, that I have in my company. I know they, they have the model, they have the skills, they, 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 they don't follow the process. But if they, they don't have a vision mm -hmm. of where we're trying to get mm -hmm. It is. Because people with more intuition, they will understand what they know how to do the process. They don't know why we're actually doing it. Mm -hmm. So for me, if I'm trying to look for somebody in one of my other mm -hmm. guys or one of my other guys, I want them I want them to have that vision and go to that. We might never reach the world class, the patient program, 
but we at least have realistic objectives that vision is actually yeah, so, And I would suggest that I, you're perfect, perfect. I mean, you're, you're a setup guy, and, and, and I didn't pay him, everybody, okay? <laughs> so I, I would suggest that, uh, that you mention the word process, you mention the word vision. If, if one were to use a process, a 12-element process, and the 50, ICML 55 is patterned after ISO 55000. You know, so it would fit nicely within that envelope. So it would be, by extension, using ISO 55000 principles in our lubrication area. But that process will help define what good looks like. Now, now you, you mentioned the word world class. Now, I would suggest that if you have the 12 elements covered in your program, and very importantly, the continuous improvement piece, that you will find world class works for you. And your version of world class is not going to be the same as your version of world class because your resources, your plant priorities, your, your capital available, uh, the importance of machinery is going to be different. So, so it, it's, it's almost naive to, to, to set up on a pedestal what world class looks like because really each practitioner that follows the process carefully can decide what world class is. And through continuous improvement through metrics, you, you have a metric in there saying, that, uh, that we don't want to change oil until it's time to change the oil. So when we, when we change the oil, we test it. How do we do? Well, the oil is on its last gasp. We're going too far. We're setting up latent conditions six to nine months out. We're, we're reducing the life of equipment. The other alternative is we're changing the oil out to the, to the vendor tech manual, and they say every three months put new oil in. Well, that's really a, a five-year oil in that application. You know, so, so you find that out based upon your conditions. Your continuous improvement process, your testing, your measurement, your feedback can help you decide on how long do we leave the oil and equipment. You, you, can, you can find that best place for you. And in some equipment, uh, it might be that you, rather than doing all this testing, because testing has a cost, that you leverage your knowledge elsewhere and you say, for this class of equipment, we're going to replace the oil every four years because it makes economic sense for us. And that's what this whole process is. And some way for we as an industry to follow a, 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 a roadmap, so to speak, in the 12 key areas that we have to determine what our programs are. That's the first step. We've got we to be critical enough to say, you know, we're really pretty weak in these three areas and they're hurting us. And, and then through the continuous improvement process, bring those three areas up. And naturally, if all these pieces are in place, we're going to find an optimal as, as, uh, as indicated, some kind of an optimal state, uh, some kind of a best practice plateau, we're gonna find that because the system will help us bring there. And that's where it's important to have a systematic type approach to something like this. Okay, so a little bit more on the continuous improvement. Start with a high level concept, move to applying a process, focus on site implementation. You'll go put your process in the field Finally, check and adjust. So once your, your process is in place, does it work? And what do we need to do to meet our original goal or is our original goal the wrong goal? We, we really are putting way too much effort into this area because it's not cost effective for us. And that's robbing these two or three areas from being better. You know, those are the kind of decisions we need to be able to make. Uh, so, so finally, I've listed the 12 areas again. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank all of you for participating in this discussion with me. I think it's been very engaging. I, I really appreciate the level of, uh, of exchange that we've had together. Uh, so I'd like to open it up for questions. Does anyone have any questions? Is uh, yes. the anomaly that has been 75,000, 55,000, uh, this is been so complex. Uh, that means we can say that yeah. Compared to ICM, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. So when we when we get this completely done, it is going to be ISO fifty five thousand compliant. Yes, and that's that that is a big deal in part of the world right now. It's going to be a big deal in all of the world, just like ni ISO nine thousand was. You know, that came out. It was a stress, and people rushed to do it. It helped everybody, but there was a stressful time. So this is being one step ahead for an area that really really matters uh, to the industrial community. Now how do how do we get the most out of our our assets? And I'm not just talking about the pump. I'm talking about all of you. Uh, how do we set up a, how do we set up sustainability in knowledge transfer? That would be an element of it. No. So so what happens in six months from now? And I'm not suggesting that you look like you're 60, but but in six months you you win the lottery 
and, and, and you, you take home 25 million big ones, whatever that means to you, and you don't want to work anymore, so you retire. So what happens to your facility when you go? And that, and that happens over a weekend. You, know, you win the big money. Uh, does your organization suffer a significant step backwards in that aspect of asset management because they no longer have anyone on site that has any clue about what they're doing? You know, they can't tell the difference between a brown oil and a yellow oil except for the color. And does it even matter if it's brown or yellow? You know, I have, have no idea about that. So, so do you kind of get the drift of that? Each of these elements are vulnerable if we don't have a process and program in place to make them not vulnerable. So, so, so good point. Any other questions? Well, uh, just a comment. Yes. I'm owner of the company doing the lubrication services, outsourcing. Yes. We're managing like 15 power plants, uh -huh. refineries in Europe. And uh, basically, we, we are following all of these 12 uh, issues uh -huh. pretty well, I think. We are businessly successful. But I'm thinking now how to implement the, the schedule rules in the whole process. You know, we. Um, because in Europe, we are pretty used to ISOs, 9,000, 14,000, 18,000, a lot of these programs, we understand it. But I'm now thinking how, how this scheduling will impact our business. Because it's a lot of work to make it so scheduled like, like the standard says. I, I'm not sure it's as scheduled and structured as you think. Uh, because because a big, you know, there's, there are a whole bunch of elements that need to be considered. But the way this, this process works is it requires a self-assessment. You know, you start out by saying, what is it that we do? And then once you have that description against what you could or should be doing, then determine a gap between what the best would look like, what, where you could ideally get to if you had all the resources in the world. And that gap is what the continuous improvement process will help define. So I would suggest that a service provider this would be an opportunity to help your customers and industries get better as they critically look at what they're doing and, and then strive to improve their process. And, and you, as, a, as an outside source with a high level of knowledge, can come in and help them better define those gaps and help them with, with a plan. Because I'd also suggest that part of this is that we need to have sustainability, and we are not going to have sustainability in many of these areas if we don't have a process in place that includes that management metrics and review thing. And, and I, I would think that you'd be a big part of that. Does that help? Okay. All right, so it I looks like uh, the time is up because our moderator stood up and... Uh, <laughs> nice job, Ryan.